All right, we are going to really quickly talk about the discovery of cells. So cells. A cell is the basic unit of all living things. So if it's a unicellular organism, it is a cell. If it is a multicellular organism, it's made of cells. So it's basically the smallest unit of life. Um, cells were first observed when we first started looking at microscopes. Um, and as you are working on your timeline right now, you'll figure out when that actually was. All cells contain small structures called organelles. These are like organs of the cell, just like we have organs that do specific functions for our body. Cells have organelles that do specific functions for the cell. There are two major classes of cells. We have prokaryotic cells. These lack nuclei or nucleus, and they don't really have many organelles at all. They're very simple. Most everything that they need just floats right in the center of the cell. Um, examples of these types of organisms are bacteria and archaea. Uh, we also have eukaryotic cells. These are more complex cells, and they're compartmentalized, meaning they have little compartments or organs that are responsible for different functions, including a nucleus that is surrounded by a membrane. Um, along with that, there are several other organelles that are surrounded by membranes as well. Examples of organisms that are eukaryotic are protists, fungi, plants, and animals. And we are ca categorized as an animal, guys, so we are eukaryotic cells. All right, microscopes. So microscopes. Um, there are lots of different types of microscopes. Um, some of the ones we won't be using in here would be the electron microscope. This allows objects to be magnified up to 500,000 times and uses electrons to actually see it instead of light. Um, so you, there's two types of electron microscopes. You have your scanning electron microscopes, and this um, allows us to see a three-dimensional shape of cells. And then we have the transmission electron microscope, which um, allow scientists to actually see the structures inside of the cell. Um, scanning probe microscopes uh, produce images while trailing surfaces of cells or structures with probes. So there's a little probe and it walks around and it hits on surfaces and so we find, um, we're able to find out the shapes of things based on how that probe reacts. So the cell theory, this is the big thing that you're going to hear a lot about. So the cell theory has three parts. All living things are made of cells. That means every single thing that's living. If you remember the seven characteristics of living things, one of them is it is made of cells. So that makes sense. Um, it also says that cells are the basic units of structure and function in living things. That means that cells are the smallest unit of life, meaning they can do all of the characteristics of living things and survive. They are the smallest unit of life that can do all of those seven things. And then finally, all cells come from other cells. That means if you have a cell, it came from a cell. Um, so yeah, and then we're going to go ahead and take a quick peek at this. Let's see if it will work. about science is that when scientists make a discovery, it's not always in a prescribed manner, as in only in a laboratory under strict settings with white lab coats and all sorts of neat science gizmos that go beep. In reality, the events and people involved in some of the major scientific discoveries are as weird and varied as they get. My case in point, the weird history of the cell theory. There are three parts to the cell theory. 1. All organisms are composed of one or more cells. 2. The cell is the basic unit of structure and organization in organisms. And 3. All cells come from pre-existing cells. To be honest, this all sounds incredibly boring until you dig a little deeper into how the world of microscopic organisms and this theory came to be. It all started in the early 1600s in the Netherlands, where a spectacle maker named Zacharias Janssen is said to have come up with the first compound microscope, along with the first telescope. Both claims are often disputed, as apparently he wasn't the only bored guy with a ton of glass lenses to play with at the time. Despite this, the microscope soon became a hot item that every naturalist or scientist at the time wanted to play with, making it much like the iPad of its day. One such person was a fellow Dutchman by the name of Anton von Leeuwenhoek, 
who heard about these microscope doohickeys, and instead of going out and buying one, he decided to make his own. And it was a strange little contraption indeed, as it looked more like a tiny paddle the size of a sunglass lens. If he had stuck two together, it probably would have made a wicked set of sunglasses that you couldn't see much out of. Anywho, once Leeuwenhoek had his microscope ready, he went to town looking at anything and everything he could with him, including the gunk on his teeth. Yes, you heard right. He actually discovered bacteria by looking at dental scrapings. Which, when you keep in mind that people didn't brush their teeth much, if at all, back then, he must have had a lovely bunch of bacteria to look at. When he wrote about his discovery, he didn't call them bacteria as we know them today, but he called them animacules because they looked like little animals to him. While Leeuwenhoek was staring at his teeth gunk, he was also sending letters to a scientific colleague in England by the name of Robert Hooke. Hooke was a guy who really loved all aspects of science, so he dabbled in a little bit of everything, including physics, chemistry, and biology. Thus it is Hooke who we can thank for the term the cell, as he was looking at a piece of cork under his microscope, and the little chambers he saw reminded him of cells, or the rooms monks slept in in their monasteries. Think college dorm rooms, but without the TVs, computers, and really annoying roommates. Hooke was something of an underappreciated scientist of his day, something he brought upon himself as he made the mistake of locking horns with one of the most famous scientists ever, Sir Isaac Newton. Remember when I said Hooke dabbled in many different fields? Well, after Newton published a groundbreaking book on how planets move due to gravity, Hooke made the claim that Newton had been inspired by Hooke's work in physics. Newton, to say the least, did not like that which sparked a tense relationship between the two that lasted even after Hook died, as quite a bit of Hook's research, as well as his only portrait, was misplaced due to Newton. Much of it was rediscovered, thankfully, after Newton's time, but not his portrait, as sadly no one knows what Robert Hook looked like. Fast forward to the 1800s, where two German scientists discovered something that today we might find rather obvious, but helped tie together what we now know as the cell theory. The first scientist was Matthias Schleiden, a botanist who liked to study plants under a microscope. From his years of studying different plant species, it finally dawned on him that every single plant he had looked at were all made of cells. At the same time, on the other end of Germany was Theodor Schwann, a scientist who not only studied slides of animal cells under the microscope and got a special type of nerve cell named after him, but also invented rebreathers for firefighters and had a kickin' pair of sideburns. After studying animal cells for a while, he too came to the conclusion that all animals were made of cells. Immediately, he reached out via snail mail, as Twitter had yet to be invented, to other scientists working in the same field, and it was Schleiden who got back to him, and the two started working on the beginnings of the cell theory. A bone of contention arose between them, as for the last part of the cell theory, that cells come from pre-existing cells. Schleiden didn't exactly subscribe to that thought, as he swore cells came from free cell formation, where they just kind of spontaneously crystallized into existence. That's when another scientist, named Rudolf Virchow, stepped in with research showing that cells did come from other cells. Research that was actually, how to put it, borrowed without permission from a Jewish scientist by the name of Robert Remack, which led to two more feuding scientists. Thus, from teeth gunk to torquing off Newton, crystallization to swan cells, the cell theory came to be an important part of biology today. Some things we know about science today may seem boring, but how we came to know them is incredibly fascinating. So if something bores you, dig deeper. It's probably got a really weird story behind it somewhere.